storyteller and that's the approach I'm going to take. Telling you a bit of the story about how I got to where I'm standing here today and along the way tell you some of the bumps and exciting things along that journey. So I'm going to talk about in my childhood what started to make me think about medicine and then spend a lot of time talking about my approach into cancer research, how I got involved, uh, what it means, uh, what cancer actually is, and what we've managed to accomplish here in Canada through collaborative pan-Canadian research. So, I'm a bit of a hoarder. My diary from grade 6, 1964, still sits on a shelf downstairs, and on February 18th, I wrote in my diary, today I decided I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. I don't know whether there was a specific thing that made me say that, but I spent a lot of time as a child in and out of hospital with bad asthma, and it was probably my exposure to the healthcare professionals that made me really intrigued about this. Anyway, I persisted. And in 1970, I graduated high school in Ottawa, Nepean High School. And I had applied to pre-medical programs in both uh, Queens and Western and didn't know quite what to choose. Western was giving me a bit of a scholarship, uh, but Queens was closer to home, and that ended up being why I decided to go to Kingston, close to Ottawa. And shortly after I started university in October 1970, my mother died at the age of 43 of breast cancer. And I'm probably not unique amongst people in this room to have a relative, a parent, grand grandparent, maybe even a sibling or friend who have been ill with this disease. And I'm sure that had an influence on what I did next. So let's talk about the accidents along the way. And this was the first one, by chance. Uh, in second year medicine, we do a course called Clinical Skills, which is how we learn to take a history, interview patients, do a physical exam. And my teacher, my group leader, was uh, a, a hematologist called Dr. David Ginsberg, originally South African and came to Kingston by way of Edinburgh and Boston. He was a fantastic mentor. He was sort of like being in a Sherlock Holmes mystery when you had him bring a patient in front of you and he got you to observe things and see things and figure things out. And working with him really convinced me I wanted to be like that person and persuaded me to move towards training in hematology. So the second sort of accidental event was that at the time I trained in hematology, which was 1979. Um, so I went through medical school, I did internal medicine, and then I subspecialized in hematology, which is the study of blood diseases. At that point in time in Canada and many places, there weren't cancer specialists. Hematologists saw all cancer patients, whether they had a blood cancer or not. Um, and so I was looking after many cancer patients as part of my training. And what I felt doing that work was, it was sometimes quite sad, but it was incredibly inspiring also to see how ordinary people could really become extraordinary facing the most frightening time of their life. Also at that time, things were really changing in the cancer world. There were, for the first time ever, effective new drug treatments emerging for cancer which started to make it a treatable and sometimes even curable disease. And I was very interested in this and thought, how can I make more of this happen? The third serendipitous event in my story is, uh, is this one. And that is that in 1980, the Canadian Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute of Canada decided it was time we really had a network of um, of hospitals and clinics working together in doing clinical trials, clinical research in cancer, and they created the NCIC clinical trials group to coordinate and conduct those trials um, ar around the country. And the first director of the group, the man who won the position, happened to be Dr. Joseph Pater, who was an oncologist and scientist at Queen's University, who was one of my te teachers and mentors. So by chance, the national office of this new cancer research um, organization was based where I was training. 
And in 1982, when I completed all my training, he asked if I wanted to take on a new position in their, uh, in their group, and that was as director of the Investigational New Drug Program, a program set up to study new cancer drugs in patients across Canada. And everyone thought, oh, this will be fun to do for two to three years, then she'll do something else. But I ended up staying there over 30 years. And just so you are aware, this group, which for many years was called the NCICCTG, a big mouthful, was renamed the Canadian Cancer Trials Group in 2016 to more accurately reflect what it does and where it is. So now I want to talk, that was the story of how I got to where I was, but what about cancer? What, what is it? Um, how are new treatments discovered? What is clinical research and lab research? And what, importantly, has Canada contributed to cancer treatment? So let's go back, 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 back. Cancer has been with us for thousands of years. As is nicely described in this book by um, Siddhartha Mukherjee, um, the Emperor of All Maladies, one of the first written documented cases of cancer was in the Persian Queen Atossa, who was who had a tumor upon her breast, which afterwards burst and spread further, almost certainly a breast cancer. So this has been around for millennia, for as long as people have been here. The theories of what's behind a cancerous tumor have changed hugely over time. And this is an important thing to think about as you think about science. Science is always evolving. There are theories that come and go, and the truth is never really at defin definitively at any one point. It's always going to change as we understand more. But the very first theories of, so of cancer came from Hippocrates, who thought it was related to an excess of black bile, one of the four humors that made up a healthy human. Then the lymph theory uh, in the 1700s came along, the fermenting lymph, the, the fluid that flows from lymph node to lymph node in your body was what was causing cancer. And then in um, the mid 19th century, a German pathologist actually showed, because microscopes were now available, that cancer was made up of really, really strange looking cells. And he proposed that it came from budding elements called blastema. I'm not even quite sure what that is. But the sort of change that sparked how we think about cancer today came from a very famous uh, pathologist called Rudolf Virchow, who really showed that cancer cells arise from other cells. In other words, they come from us. So I like to call this cancers are us, just gone very, very wrong. So, what causes this change and what's it comprised of? Why does this even happen? And the importance of this is if you understand the why, you could p potentially prevent, prevent it from occurring. And the causes of cancer in an individual person, you actually can't always pin down. But we do know that many things increase the chance over a lifetime of getting cancer. So there's viral and chemical car so-called carcinogens. Car carcinogens a word that means cancer generating, so carcinogens. Tobacco is the most famous one. About one third of all cancers that occur today are related to tobacco, and it's not just lung. It can be throat cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, pancreas cancer, and more. Asbestos. Thankfully, not a common substance in our areas anymore, but it used for many years for insulation, and it caused a very um, tough-to-treat cancer called mesothelioma, which is sort of a thickening of the lining around the lung and around the abdomen inside. Radiation causes cancer. Um, uh, sunlight is the most common radiation we're exposed to, and it uh, can lead to skin cancers. And importantly, viruses can cause cancer. The viruses that you think you've thrown off can sit there in some hidden way in your body and, and um, over years produce uh, cancers. The most common ones are things like human papillomavirus, which can lead to cervical and oral or mouth cancers. Um, hepatitis B, a very common cause of liver cancer. Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus that causes infectious mono, can lead to a kind of lymphoma. And also, um, recently some have said, is perhaps the cause of multiple sclerosis. 
So you can imagine there are strategies that might tackle prevention around these things, but just growing old increases the risk of cancer. A lifetime of cell divisions, a lifetime of cells which are complex computer programs copying themselves over and over, mistakes happen, mutations happen, and some of those lead to changes that actually uh, become cancerous. So if that's the cause, what is it that those things are doing inside cells to make them behave so wrongly? Because if this is our cell, why is it doing this to us? And if we understood that, maybe we could figure out how to reverse that and treat it. Well, one thing that the last sort of 50 years of uh, molecular biology has revealed is that when you examine a cancer cell and look at its genetics and how it's working, there can be hundreds or even thousands of changes that um, are um, at the genetic level in those cells, mutations, that bring with them the drive to continue growing and dividing, to, um, to invade and to spread. So it's sort of like the cancer, the cells don't know when to stop. Um, years ago, when I was talking to some public school students, I said, imagine if your earlobe didn't know when to stop growing and it just throughout your life went dragging down and down until you were sort of dragging it down your street. Of course that doesn't happen. There is a program in your cells that knows when to stop the cell division very uh, intricate, finely tuned. Well, cancer has kind of taken over that program and shut it down. So all of those things that I described as carcinogens do things that increase the risk of genetic mistakes happening inside cells, which if they're the right mistakes and they accumulate over time can lead to cancer. So how have we, How's humanity tried to treat cancer? Because this, as I said, been around millions of years, thousands of years, I mean. Well, not very well for most of the time. Um, patients or people who had cancer diagnosed, let's say, two or 300 years ago, they'd be dead within months or a year, maybe, of having it found. And then in the 19th century, suddenly surgery was made possible. People learned about how to keep things sterile so you could operate without causing infections that led to death. And anesthesia was discovered so people didn't suffer through the surgery. So that really enabled surgeons to remove cancers that otherwise they would have just left. And then at the end of the 19th century, radiation was discovered and no one really quite knew what to do with this at first. But by the middle of the 20th century, and especially here in Saskatchewan, one of the first places in North America enough was understood about how to deliver radiation safely. It could be actually used to kill cancer. So while radiation in smaller doses over time can cause it, higher doses can kill cells, can kill cancer cells. And then in 1947, the National Cancer Institute of Canada was formed specifically to do more research in cancer, basic research, but also clinical research to try to um, treat the disease. And since that time, largely through initially efforts at the U.S. National Cancer Institute, drugs have been found by looking at agricultural natural products, marine products, and chemical products um, powdered in petri dishes to see what sorts of drugs might kill cancer cells, and more recently, intelligently designed treatments based on what we know goes wrong molecularly have come forward as potential drug treatments for cancer. So what I want to talk about is what it takes. Let's say you've found a discovery in, or someone has found a discovery in the lab and they think it might be important in turning a cell cancerous, and they think they found a drug that might reverse that and may be useful as a treatment. So what does it take to go from that astonishing finding to actually treating patients with it? And every potential cancer treatment, first of all, has to go through really rig rigorously um, some preclinical or laboratory research, testing that new drug in cells in a petri dish, testing it in mice-bearing tumors, like the one you see at the bottom here, to see if it actually shrinks those tumors or stops cancer cells growing. But also, you have to evaluate what side effects does it produce. 
uh, a drug that can kill a cancer but also causes terminal heart failure is not going to be very useful. So understanding the side effects or toxicity, making sure you can make the drug in a way that's sterile and safe, and then looking at how are we going to give it to people? Do we give it intravenously? Do we give it orally? Do we give it once a month, once a week, once a day? All of those studies are done in the lab before you even think about human studies. And then understanding how, it's, how, it's, how the body gets rid of the drug and, and metabolizes it. So that huge package has to be put together before you even think about giving it to a human being. Regardless of where a new treatment comes from, it also needs to undergo a set of clinical experiments once that lab work is done. And the first thing we do when we have a new drug, and this is what I spent most of my life doing, was to see how best to dose it in humans with cancer, in patients with cancer. And that's called a phase one trial. It's usually very small numbers of patients who volunteer to receive the drug. And the goal of that is to determine what's the best dose and what are the side effects. And then the next phase takes that dose and looks at it to see if it actually helps small numbers of patients by causing their tumors to shrink when they get it, which is a pretty good marker. You've got something good going on. So in this kind of trial called a phase two trial, again, it's usually small numbers of patients, all with the same cancer type. And what we would look at is shown here on this um, CT scan. So this is a scan of a slice through your chest. And the whites or the dark stuff are, are lungs filled with air. The white blob in the middle is your heart. And this thing with the arrow is a tumor, a sphere of tumor cells in the middle of that patient's lung. And what we want to see when we give a patient a new drug in a phase two study is a shrinkage of that as in here. So there's quite a dramatic change in those two. So that drug really seemed to have had an effect and maybe it's worth studying further. And then the final study are larger so-called randomized trials where patients are assigned randomly to get a treatment with the new drug included versus what they would have got otherwise. And what we're looking for there is do they live longer? Are they potentially cured more? And um, is their quality of life um, better on the new drug? And that can take hundreds or thousands of patients. So all of this takes some time. And in my work, I spent most of my time doing phase one and two and occasional phase three trials. So a clinical trial is an experiment to evaluate a new drug or new therapy. And some people are scared about that thought. Well, uh, you're treating me like, um, like a lab rat, maybe. But actually, no. These are rigorously undertaken research protocols where the study protocol outlines who can be treated, how the treatment's given, what's being measured, how you document results, and how you report the results. And it's only conducted by trained clinical investigators and institutions, and both ethical and Health Canada oversights are in place to ensure the safety of patients enrolled in such studies. The other thing I get asked is, well, if you know this really works well in mice and you know a safe dose in people, why can't we just use it? And the sad fact is that we've become really, really good at curing mice tumors. And a lot of the things that work in mice don't work very well in patients. So that's why we have to do it. And here's an example I was involved with. This was a study in ovarian cancer. So mice with ovarian cancer were given a drug called a matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor. Half of them got it, half of them did it. And this curve is called a survival curve and it demonstrates, assuming they all start treatment on the same point in time, that if you follow them over time, how many are still alive. And the top curve sh shows that every time that a step goes down, another mouse has died, but out at 160 days, two of the mice were still alive versus those that just got um, sugar water um, were all dead by day 20. So that's a huge difference. If you saw that in ovarian cancer patients, that would be a hugely dramatic effect. So that's why we studied it. We did exactly the same treatment in ovarian cancer patients, and this is the result in women with ovarian cancer given the same drug and the same equivalent dose and schedule 
and it had uh, no statistically significant effect. You see a bit of difference between the lines, but the statistical uh, test was didn't show that that was anything more than chance. So that's why we need to test these in patients. I'm going to give you three examples of studies I was involved with that have um, that are kind of interesting. Two of them were studies that I did directly, and one was from my colleagues at the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. So let's start with this one. This is a golden oldie. James Johnson, shown here, is a hematologist and lab scientist in Winnipeg at the University of Manitoba. And he was very interested in a weird kind of leukemia called hairy cell leukemia. And hairy cell leukemia looks just like what you'd imagine. These are an excess of white cells in the blood, and they have little hairy protrusions all over them. And it hadn't been very successfully treated up to then. And he found that this compound, deoxycofermycin, or DCF, worked in the lab. So we worked together, put a package together for Health Canada, and started a trial in Canada of hairy in this disease um, in multi-center study. And we saw 100% of patients had improvement, and in fact, close to 90% had a complete remission. That's what CR stands for. All evidence of the disease disappeared, and in many patients it was for years. So that was pretty exciting. And even better, the first patient enrolled in this trial was by me. I was referred a patient in Kingston just as soon as the trial opened. And this gentleman had a massive spleen, which is an organ in the left upper quadrant of your abdomen, usually tucked in under your ribs. You shouldn't be able to feel it. And it had filled his entire left abdomen, a hard mass, filling his entire left abdomen. His bone marrow was packed. He had hairy cells in his blood. And he got three doses of deoxycofermycin once a week for three weeks. And his spleen had gone down to normal size. His bone marrow and blood were clear of leukemia. It was absolutely the most exciting clinical trial patient I have had. And there's nothing more that makes you think, I am definitely doing something that is bringing meaning when you participate in a trial when this happens. So the second example I'm going to say starts with a tree. It starts with the western U, the home of a very odd kind of owl on the Pacific coast, Taxus brevifola. And Bark from the Western U was harvested as part of the, the United States National Cancer Institute screening program looking for plant products that might be affected against cancers. And this very complex molecule, goodness knows why the U is making it, um, was extracted and found to be active in um, the Petri dish and in mice with tumors. And it worked by a unique way, so it moved eventually into human studies, phase one trials in the US. And they had lots of problems with this drug. As soon as you gave it to patients, they had almost like a bad allergic reaction, shortness of breath, pain, redness, feeling like death is happening, um, like a severe allergy. Uh, heart side effects, their heart rate slowed down very slow in many cases, but there were a few patients who had ovary and breast cancer that seemed to be having their tumors shrink. So what you do then is not give up. You try to get around those side effects and make it better. So they gave pre-medications like antihistamines and steroids to stop the allergic reactions. They prolonged the infusion and admitted patients to hospitals so it was only slowly dripped in. Um, and that seemed to help. And we in Canada were really interested in being able to study this, so we made a proposal to do the first Taxol trial in Canada. We collaborated with colleagues in Europe because we wanted to recruit as many patients as we could quickly, and we wanted to figure out if there was a best way to give the drug, and we wanted to randomize patients to get it of a short infusion or long in a low or high dose. Um, and patients were randomized to either a high or low dose or a short or long schedule. And any one patient would have two randomizations and end up in this box, perhaps, or that box. And we randomized hundreds of patients and followed them to see what happened. And the first thing we found out is that giving the shorter infusion to everyone's surprise was actually safer. It produced less bone marrow suppression, and it didn't have more hypersensitivity reactions. And the higher dose was better. And this became the way Taxol was given then 
and to this day. So it really changed practice around the world. It also led us to say, let's put it right up front in ovarian cancer. And here's a survival curve, same as we showed before, 100% of patients getting the Taxol treatment. And this is their survival experience versus those that didn't. And overall, at the median point, one year gain in, in survival. So quite a dramatic effect. Again, a treatment that um, continues to this day. And the third example I'm going to give is a more modern uh, drug, and that is one that is affecting one of those molecular mutations that happens in cancer called the epidermal growth factor receptor. And many labs found that this receptor on cells seemed to be really important in driving the cell to continue to grow abnormally. And here's a picture of it on the top of the cell. And as you can see, there's a complex network of chain reactions that happen downstream, which you need not worry about. The point is that this was the starting point. And when it was mutated, it didn't ever turn off. It just kept pushing, pushing. It's sort of like driving with your foot stuck on the accelerator and no brake available. So, not surprisingly, um, scientists started to work at a way to inhibit this, to stop this from happening. Those were called EGFR inhibitors. And in Canada, the CCTG studied them. And one of the big studies we did was in lung cancer, where we were the first group in the world to show that giving this to lung cancer patients improved their survival. Now, the survival in lung cancer is still not great, but it added many months of good quality to some people's lives. So how are we doing with cancer? I've talked about when I started my work back in the early 80s. Here we are 40 years later. Um, it's really clear cancer remains an important cause of death and suffering still around the world. But the outlook for some or even many cancers have improved over this same period. If we look at, in the 1980s, how many people survived five years after their cancer diagnosis versus today, we see some pretty dramatic changes. Um, some of this is due to treatment. Some of it might be screening. But as you can see, in colon cancer, bowel cancer, 45 versus 65 percent, breast cancer, quite a jump, prostate cancer, huge, likely due to screening and finding many men with very early disease, lung, not so big a jump, and still a lot of work to do. So just to summarize, I hope you understood it was just a series of chance events in a way that led to my involvement with the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. And I guess the lesson there is you can't plan a chance that will come your way, but you can be prepared to recognize that this is an opportunity that could be exciting. And don't be afraid of that. I feel privileged to have spent more than 35 years in cancer care and research, and feel fortunate that some of the research I did has made a difference to some patients and improved their care. The clinical trial route I took is really not easy. These are complex experiments. It requires collaboration across the country and world sometimes to bring in different places. And here in Saskatoon, the Cancer Centre has been an active contributor to our studies. But they are the critical step that we need to do to evaluate new treatments for patients. So I'd like to thank, firstly, the thousands of patients and their families who, with commitment and courage, volunteered to go on these trials sometimes with the hope it would help them. But very often they said, well, if it doesn't help me, maybe it will help someone in future. To the research agencies that have supported the work, largely the Canadian Cancer so Society, um, who has supported the clinical trials group continuously since, the 19, since 1980, as well as the other organizations here. Pharmaceutical industry is an important partner. They do a lot of drug discovery which allows us to get the drugs from them, to study in patients in our trials, and to collaborating investigators and institutions across the country. So with that, I will stop. I will thank you for listening to my rapid fire presentation and welcome questions.